Hello everyone, Jennifer L. Scott here and welcome to The Daily Connoisseur. I have such a treat for you today. Dr. Patty Tay is back with us. We're going to be discussing the new intermittent fasting study that came out that links intermittent fasting with cardiovascular death. Yeah, we're going there. I know that sounds really scary, but Dr. Patty breaks it down for us. And we talk about so many other things related to intermittent fasting. A lot of you left your comments and questions in the community tab, and Dr. Patty is addressing those in today's video as well. Dr. Patty Tay is a pediatrician who is board certified in obesity medicine and pediatrics. And it's such an honor to have her come back on the channel today. I hope that you will welcome her with me. And now without further ado, my chat with Dr. Patty Tay. Welcome to the channel, Dr. Patty Tay. It's so good to have you back. Hi, Jennifer, good to see you again. I'm so thrilled you're here. So this study came out recently in the news and all of these people were emailing me about it. And the first person I thought of was you. I thought, I need Dr. Patty to break this down for me. <laughs> and you were so gracious in responding and agreeing to come on the channel so we could talk about this. So this is the headline for the study that we're, we're all you know wondering about. Basically, yes. that following the 16-8 method of intermittent fasting gives you a 91% higher risk of dying from heart disease compared to people <laughs> who follow a more traditional pattern of eating. I, I saw that headline and I thought, what? <laughs> at first I thought, at first I thought, oh, it must be for one of the more extreme fasts, not 16, eight, but it was 16, eight. So please break this down for us. What does this mean? Yes. Yeah, so I'm glad you reached out to me too, because I was in the, in the process of investigating this myself when I saw it, because it really goes against everything we already know about intermittent fasting. There's just been many, many studies that have been done. Um, and, uh, you know, from three months to a year, and none of them show any adverse effects. You know, nobody has right. more heart attacks or more health problems. So, you know, across the board, we believe that intermittent fasting, not just 16-8, but even, you know, 5-2 or alternate day, like all these different kinds are all safe universally. That's kind of the, the message that we have in the obesity medicine community. Okay. So, so, so I actually um, went to the American Heart Association website, which is where that study was published. And, you know, uh, if you look at it, it's not even a full paper. It's just kind of like a little abstract, mm -hmm. um, which means that the researchers are saying, like, we're looking at this. This is really interesting. So we're giving you guys a little glimpse of what we're going to talk about. And, and it's not like they have numbers or actually data there for people to examine and say, oh, no, this doesn't make any sense. This doesn't make any sense. Okay. Um, and when you actually look at the real, real fine print. So what they did was um, they looked at 20,000 people. Mm -hmm. in something called the National Health and Nutrition um, Examination Survey. And this is something that the CDC has been doing since like 1971. You know, every year they, they do the survey. And what they did was they asked people one day, what did you eat yesterday? <laughs> okay. And they just said, what time did you eat your food? Okay. And then they wrote it down. And then they went back another time and they asked the same question. So they asked them just twice. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> right. It wasn't like they said, oh, do you follow a 16-8 fasting, you know, or do you do intermittent fasting? That's not, or have you been doing it for a long time? It was just, they just sat on a random day and asked them, what did you eat yesterday? Okay. Right. So yeah, that's, that's, just, it's just misleading because the, the headline is sensational and then you almost just read, sometimes I just read the headline and I think, well, that's it. You know what? <laughs> right. But when you dig a bit deeper, it wasn't, it wasn't people who were intentionally doing the 16-8 method necessarily. Right. Okay. Or they may not even be doing the 16-8 even unintentionally. You know, they may have been eating all day and just not remembering that they had toast, you know, at eight in the morning. Okay. Got it. Right. Or they may not be counting kind of like the handful of, you know, M&Ms they had at 10 p.m. while they were watching a movie, which would make their eating window 16 hours, right? right? But just remember the big meals. Um, and, and, you know, and like, we, I think you talk about this on your channel, too, is just we just do a lot of mindless eating out of habit. Mm-hmm. 
Right. And yes. so being intentional about that and doing a real true 16, eight and setting a time um, can really help kind of with our bad eating habits. That's right. It's almost like that kind of like childlike mentality. You know, if anybody's ever said, I'm going to control my spending and you're like, I'm going to write down everything I spend in a day. And then you start doing it and, and you write down like the gas that you, that you put in your car and maybe lunch, but you don't write down what you spent at the Dollar Tree or what you spent here because it right. doesn't count, you know? Right. So I right. think that's like what people do with eating too sometimes where they, they had dinner early, maybe at five, and then they'll have like some chips at 10, but that doesn't count, you know? So right. that, that could have been at play here too, is what it sounds right. like. Right. Okay. And, and the other thing that we have to think about is, you know, maybe this is a true eight hour with eating window that people are capturing. Um, we're not seeing how much food did they eat during those eight hours? You know, uh, I don't see that in the paper itself and maybe that that will be published. Okay. So if you're consuming 3,500 calories within an eight hour eating window, um, we are going to see poor health scores long term, right? We know right. just kind of like healthy eating is around like, you know, 2,500 to 3,000 for, uh, for adults. And so, um, and I think that's kind of like the new thing that's coming up with intermittent fasting is that, you know, is just limiting your eating window to eight hours enough for health? Mm. And, 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 I, and I see that kind of a lot in the comment sections mm. um, with, with people asking, like, if I really follow 16, will that help with like my weight loss, with my obesity, you know, with my blood pressure and all those things? And I would say since the last time we spoke, um, more of the research is saying maybe. <laughs> it's not yes. Yeah, that's right. And I think from my own experience, because I've been fasting now for about four years, for me, it's definitely a combination of the time restriction because it's allowing me to, it's, I'm not having late night snacks. Um, mm -hmm. But it's also, you know, I do have pretty normal to maybe small portion sizes, which I know we're going to talk about in this um, mm -hmm. interview. Mm -hmm. And also mm -hmm. I do try to eat a healthy diet. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that all contributes as well. But I do see some intermittent fasting channels sometimes where they're like, you can eat whatever you want. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't think that that's the healthiest mindset necessarily. We sh should still have an eye toward what we're actually eating. Right. And so, you know, I say it very specifically to my patients, um, when we think about food, we should think about um, how often we're eating, number one. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what is the hour span kind of we're eating? Um, we have to think about what are we eating and how much are we eating, right? And, and what time, sorry, and the what time actually is important. Um, we are seeing that eating at night uh, tends to kind of diminish from the effects of that 16-8 fasting. If, we are, if our eight-hour fasting window is later in the day, you know, from like 12 o'clock to 8 p.m., versus somebody who eats from like 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And I, I know we've talked about that before. Yes. Oh, right. The early dinners. That's what I always say to people. Dr. Patty loves the early dinners. <laughs> <laughs> well, science, science is that we should try to kind of eat yes, kind of science, earlier. And that yeah. helps, so Confirmed right, by right, you, so. which is always helpful. Yes. <laughs> um, this was not yeah. a peer-reviewed study either. It's important to note that, right? Is that yes. correct? Okay. So, so it will be peer-reviewed at some it point. Will be. Okay. Yes, but it's not peer review just yet. Okay. Um, but I think even beyond the peer review, I think just the way that they did the study, it's not necessarily the way we think of like, oh, it, you know, is 16-8 good or bad? You know, the only way we would know that is if we asked 100 people, you know, let's everybody do 16 and we're going to follow your for eight years and then see what happens to you. And like, if they said, oh yeah, we did that and there's more heart attack, then we would believe that, you know what I Absolutely. mean? Absolutely. <laughs> and were the participants of this study obese to begin with? Do we know any of that information? We, we don't. do not. Okay. We don't, and we don't know their final weight either, or if they had heart problems to begin with. Are right. they older? You know, are they postmenopausal women? We don't have any of those information, you know, data points. So okay, and that that matters. So because yes. I know, I just I remember reading the study and thinking there is no way because simply for me, sixteen eight is really like not snacking after dinner, having an early dinner, not snacking, and I just don't see in my brain logically how that would lead to such a dramatic risk for someone. So right. I know it's not for everybody, but for me, it's been so beneficial. So yes. it's good to know this. Yes. And, you know, all studies always concern. There was just like a recent one in December, a really big study called Select Study, um, which saw kind of weight loss with 
Ozempic, I don't know if you know oh, kind yes. of your viewers are familiar. So wait, Ozempic is a shot that you give once a week for diabetes treatment. Okay. Except one of the side effects is that you lose a lot of weight with it. Mm. So they wanted to see, you know, if giving the shot once a week um, is going to help with heart disease and diabetes. And it's an overwhelming yes. Like there's just no question about it. And it's like really? something like 25, 25% reduction in um, risk. So, and, and that's kind of just generally proven across the board. If we can have somebody lose five to 10% of their body weight, we are going to see significant improvement in their, you know, diabetes or cholesterol or, or um, you know, kind of other high blood pressure problems and so forth. So that's so interesting. I mean, not that we're going to veer off onto Ozempic, but I'm curious about mm -hmm. it because you're seeing it in the news all the time. And a lot of the celebrities are taking it. Um, right. Are what, because for me, I look at that and I think that's something I would stay away from just because it seems artificially induced because it's with the drug and you'd have to stay on it the rest of your life. But are there other risks? I mean, is in intermittent fasting better than Ozempic at the end of the day? Or are you not able to comment on that? Right. So I think the research is not enough. And I think long term, as we look at this longer and longer, probably they will find more issues with it, but, mm. you know, cause it's still kind of really new. Yeah. Um, the medical community is seeing that Ozempic is really amazing. <laughs> it really, really? Is. I'm so it surprised really by this. Right. Wow. I right. felt like such a, I don't know, like an Ozempic hater kind of <laughs> where I'm like, right. Oh, I don't know because of the way that it's portrayed in the news, like, Oh, the celebrities are taking it, you know, right. but that's interesting to hear. Huh? Right. So right now it's so popular and so effective that there's a lot of restrictions on who can, who can get it. Okay. Um, and you have to have kind of a known medical condition in addition to obesity oh. okay. um, to be able to qualify. So, so it's really hard. Um, but so far, you know, almost all of the data supports that Ozempic leads to weight loss and weight loss leads to improved health scores. So, you know, I think what will end up happening is pretty soon this will be in a kind of a pill form. Mm -hmm. And it will probably become prescribed like um, high blood pressure or high um, cholesterol medications wow. to help people manage their medical. I think that is in the future. That's probably what we'll say. <laughs> wow. And I wonder if people will use that in conjunction with IF or. I'm, Absolutely. I'm Right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And actually, let's kind of, you know, segue into the other big question that people are asking, you know, is um, how to do IF um, effectively. And, yes. you know, we'll just kind of say blanket statement. It has been proven to be safe across all studies. So we 100 percent recommend it. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, kind of I've, I've been seeing a lot of um, obesity since uh, the pandemic. And so uh, working with patients kind of over the last five years and really trying to encourage intermittent fasting with them, they come back with a couple of different things. So I think um, just in your viewers, I see a couple of buckets of uh, people asking questions. So the yes. first bucket would be people who have known medical conditions. Mm -hmm. So they have some kind of adrenal problem or they already have diabetes, they're on medication for it and so forth. Um, and I would actually put pregnancy in that category as well, pregnancy and um, early breastfeeding. Um, and that population, I would say, you know, uh, intermittent fasting should be done with your doctor. You should really go to them and talk about your intentions. Um, because uh, from, from a doctor's point of view, I wanna see you back in six to eight weeks and monitor your kind of you know, labs to make sure that uh, the medications you're taking don't have to be changed. That's really the, the big thing. Um, Cause right. if you fast naturally, all these hormones that your body releases, it will stop releasing it You know, when you fast, kind of it, it adjusts, it's an automated system. But if you have a medical disease and you're taking medicines, you're not stopping that input, right? You're just still giving yourself the same dose. Yes, that's right. Okay, that's good right. to know because we do right. have a lot so, of those questions. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I would say medical conditions, you really need to talk to a doctor and kind of monitor yourself before you do that. Okay. So then there's also a large category of people who have kind of borderline things going on. Mm -hmm. And I would call kind of like the pre-diabetes, high blood pressure, mm -hmm. um, like kind of the perimenopausal or postmenopausal, all mm -hmm. those conditions in that bucket. And, and with those, and I would say um, if you're breastfeeding, and it's been more than three months, I would put you in that category as well. Because, oh, okay. um, right, the first three months, you know, after a baby, it's not even just about the breastfeeding. It's like your own body's trying to recover. Oh, yeah. Um, and you don't want to kind of deprive yourself of calories if you need them. Mm -hmm. um, and also you're trying to establish breastfeeding. And, um, you know, even if you're not breastfeeding, I would still say the first three months, we want to be a little bit more careful. Um, but after that, um, 
if you're in kind of like a borderline state and you're looking at intermittent fasting, you know, the most common thing I hear back from people is when I do the fast, I don't feel very well. Um, like they'll say they feel jittery, they're mm -hmm. getting headaches, they're getting sweaty, um, you know, kind of they feel nauseated. Um, and that's not uh, uncommon. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're used to eating large meals at certain parts of the day. Mm -hmm. So say that you're used to having a large family meal at 7 p.m. And now because you're doing IF, it's not in your eating window. Right. So you're pushing through your fast starting at, say, like 5 p.m. and you don't eat at 7. What happens to your body is all those you know, hormones, especially the insulin, is coming out at 7 o'clock mm -hmm. with nothing to kind of digest it. And then you're going to feel kind of that hypoglycemic effects. Okay, that makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, and, and they're diabetics who have this problem. Sometimes they give themselves some extra insulin and they feel this. And there's a quick way to treat that. I, um, they give themselves some sugar really quickly. Yes. Right. Okay. So like, like a quick glass of juice or, um, you know, I don't recommend like nuts or like avocados or something kind of slow to digest. We want something really quick and it doesn't have to be a lot, just like kind of one glass um, mm -hmm. can help with that feeling. If people are feeling that way when they're starting their fast. Oh, okay. So you do recommend just kind of, uh, that makes sense because I feel like the body panics a little bit and, right. uh, and, and it has that response of like fight or flight, like, wait, you're not feeding me anymore. What's going on here? Right. <laughs> and does it hold oh, on to fat when that happens? Right. Or, right. It's not even that we need the calories. It's just that our body's used to eating at that time, a large meal. And if you've been making insulin at 7 PM for years and years, and you're certainly not like yes. fulfilling that, that need, you're going to feel ill. Right. Right. So. And so this leads into something that I really want to talk to you about, because mm -hmm. I've also interviewed Dr. Mindy Peltz, as you know, yes, on yes. the channel, and yes. she recommends that women particularly vary their fasts and that they don't fast the week before their cycle begins mm -hmm. and maybe vary it a few times in the month. So I started doing that based on her recommendation, but I find it mm -hmm. very difficult because I, my body is and me, I'm the type of person that I like to do the same thing every day. And so not fasting is difficult. And I think you just answered my question why it's because when I have a later dinner, then my body kind of expects that the next day. And then if I don't suddenly take it away, I'm going through that whole beginning phase again, where I'm, you know, expecting it. So how mm -hmm. do you recommend varying fasts and how can we work around this? That's a really good question. So um, from a doctor's perspective, what we really want is for patients to be healthy for a very long time, <laughs> right? Yes. So I think people sometimes do IF um, to lose weight very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it certainly works. Um, but, you know, our perspective is we want kind of to create something for patients that they can do for the rest of their lives. Yes, and uh, I would say if there are people who don't feel very good the week before their period because mm -hmm. they need the extra calories and breaking their fast makes them feel better, by all means, they should do that. Okay. But I'm and not one of those get, people. So should I not right, do it? <laughs> right. Exactly. So okay, then if you're yeah. not one of those people, you don't have to do that at all. Oh. And then I would say kind of the flip side is, you know, some patients will come in just aside from IF, some patients come and say, oh my gosh, I'm creating potato chips like crazy always the week before my period, or like somebody will say, I really want like chocolate the week before my period. And you know what? Potato chips have salt and, you know, these kids tend to have low blood pressure. And mm. so their body's telling them they need more salt to raise their blood pressure. Yeah. Right. And then chocolate has iron. So probably their body's just saying you need more iron rich foods. I like where this conversation is going. Yes, <laughs> right. So I tell kids, try to have some like salty soups that week before your period. Salty soups. Um, mm. Yes, because you, you want more salty, you want more fluids. And then if you're really craving chocolate, you know, don't go for chocolate. Right. Um, try to find some iron rich food supplements. So, right. So for you, I would say if you really don't feel different the week before your period mm -hmm. and you feel great on 16, 8, I don't see why we have to um, change things. Yeah. But at the same time, 100%, there are people who feel terrible right. and, and they need the extra carbs and they need to break their fast. And they, you know, by all yeah. means, we support that as well, right? I love that because it, it, um, it plays on your intuition, which is something that I think so many people ignore based on advice or what you think you should be doing. 
And I have been doing that a lot lately. So sometimes I will feel like just, you know, really hungry at night and I'll be like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm not going to fast today and I'm going to eat something before bed. Um, and I always, I feel great when I do that. And there's no mental like, oh no, you shouldn't be doing this. You know, it's more like my body's telling me this, I'm going to do it, you know, and right. just that's what it is. And then not, you know, not worrying about it so much. So I think that that's really great. So we can vary it if, if we're feeling intuitively, like that's what needs to happen. Yes. Um, yeah, I think it's a fine balance. Yeah. And maybe that kind of is a good way to transition to kind of how I recommend um, people kickstart their IF journey yes. uh, when I have patients coming in. So um, I think we talked about this before too, but the, the most common eating pattern in um, the modern world is eating kind of every one and a half to three hours. Mm -hmm. um, and I call those eating events. It may not be a big meal, but we end up putting something in our mouth, like mm -hmm. even if it's a drink or coffee or tea or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and so uh, trying to do a 16, um, eight suddenly when we're used to having calories every hour and a half is very difficult. And mm -hmm. we say, oh, you might feel sick. Mm -hmm. um, and so I try to get patients to start by trying to do a four hour fast during okay. the day. Oh, during the right? day. Okay. During the day. Mm -hmm. So like if you have breakfast, you want to wait four hours before putting anything in your mouth. Ah, oh, Okay. So only water between the two eating events is what I would call it. I don't even call them meals. They're eating events. Ah, that's interesting. Right. And then you do your kind of midday eating event. Mm -hmm. And then you want to wait four hours until your evening eating event. Okay. Right. And then you can do one more eating event at the 16th hour if you need to do it. Okay. And what does this do? I mean, so what's the it's difference just, there? Right. Right. So it's just trying to slowly treat, uh, treat, teach your body not to release so many hormones. So, you know, particularly mm -hmm. insulin every hour and a half. And so then we have kids come back and say, I can't do four hours. I don't feel very good. Mm -hmm. Then then we'll say, okay, then why don't we try to start with two and a half hours? Okay. So no eating events for two and a half hours. That means only water between. Mm -hmm. And then you um, can have an event um, and then push yourself another two and a half hours. And we try to do that for one to two weeks until your body adjusts. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then and then the next stage is push it to three. Mm -hmm. And you can see how where this is going, right? Another, okay. so we do 30 minute increments, three and a half, and then we get to four hours. Okay. And so right. this is a good way to start. Yes. And okay. don't worry about the, am I doing eight hour eating windows, you know, 12 hour eating windows. I don't even have them worry about that. I don't have them worry about, you know, what am I eating during these times? So I have to restrict what I'm eating. So once they can do that, I don't eat anything for four hours. Um, then we talk about going to that 16, eight window. Oh, you know, it's so funny because I feel like we're just, it's such a clever way to bring yeah. us back to how we just used to eat anyway. Yes. Where if you look at our great grandparents, they were not eating all the time, constantly all day long, popping something into their mouth as they walked into the kitchen. They right. had breakfast and then they went out and worked or did whatever they did for four hours, probably. And then they had lunch and then they didn't right. eat anything until dinner, you know, and right. that's just how people ate for so long. But now we have to retrain ourselves this way. Right, right. Right. And that's why we see some people say 16, eight is so easy for them because they're all, and, or they lose a lot of weight when they start doing 16, eight, mm -hmm. because they really only eat three times a day and they were doing a fourth meal and effectively we cut that fourth meal out. And I think that's kind of your story that's where me. you just took that. Right. And then like the weight is coming off. Right. Yeah. Um, but if people are doing um, 16, eight, but they're used to eating every hour and a half, two hours, sometimes they're not really cutting off a lot of calories at the end. And so you mm. don't see the scale move that much. Okay. Right. That's interesting to know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so then like we get two kids getting to 16, eight. So it's just three eating events. Um, and then we start to work on what are your portion sizes after that? Mm -hmm. And you right. primarily work with, um, children who are st struggling with obesity. Is that correct? Right. In your uh, practice? So, so not so much children, it's mostly teens and young Teenagers, adults. Because, teens and young adults. Yeah, yeah, because for children where there are weight concerns, you know, parents can intervene and control their eating. Right. A lot of times, right. So, so that's not as hard as helping a teen or young adult who has a lot mm -hmm. more independence, right? Mm -hmm. And access to food. Right. Yeah, I think it's great to give them these resources and, you know, you yes. can do this, you know, and, and get them to the next step to kind of yes. pair back eating. I do think, especially young people now, you know, I remember in college too, you just have such bad eating habits. 
yes. that it's good to establish good eating habits early on so that you're not struggling later on, you know, with obesity. Right. Mm -hmm. Or just sitting down to a proper meal and eating. And, and I tell my patients, you know what, whatever you kind of really want to eat in between those four hours, just say, I'm going to save it, you know, say like, oh, I really wanted that cookie that like my sister just baked fresh from the oven, mm -hmm. say, I will save it. And when that four hour mark is up, I get to eat my meal and that cookie too, kind of and mm -hmm. retraining the way that we eat. I love that too, because it's not <laughs> saying, oh, it's not deprivation and, and that, um, that's great. Can we right. touch really quickly again on portion sizes? Because people yes. loved when you talked about that last time. Can you oh, update us on anything or give us some more motivation? Sure. So I'm not a nutritionist. I don't have a yes. license. So I don't really, um, I can't really specifically say what to eat mm -hmm. or what not to eat. But you know, same again, like we were just kind of the theme of this whole talk is I don't restrict um, my patients on saying like, you can't have pizza or you mm. can't have like a donut, right? Because mm -hmm. um, then life is just not very fun. Right, right. <laughs> right. I couldn't agree so more. We, right. So we say, you know, um, and also it just um, starts to take up so much mental energy when we're thinking about, okay, what do I have to eat to make kind of this yeah. calorie count work? Um, so, you know, we'll just say, you know, fist size portion for a carb. Um, you want to do a palm size portion for a protein. And you really, if you're still hungry afterwards, you try to fill that hunger with more fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to not restrict any fruit because um, generally my experience is that people are not having, you know, blood sugar problems because of fruit consumption. Right. Even though it has <laughs> a lot of carbs in it. Right. Yeah. Right. So, um, so, uh, and then the biggest thing that we really work on is no, um, beverages with calories in it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. That's a big one in our house. And, you know, my kids are really used to it. They get it as a treat if we go to a restaurant, but right. it's water or milk or tea at our house, right. basically. Yeah. That's great because we know that actually drinking a sugary beverage counts as an eating event, right? So yes. you're resetting that four hour clock. If you have even something that we think is good for us, which is like a fruit smoothie, that still counts as an eating event. So yeah, right. that's good to yeah. know. Um, and let me just briefly touch upon kind of the different kinds of fast because people do ask yes. about that. 16-8 is not the only um, in the way. I, like I was reading about OMAD. That's, I think, what people call it, which is yes. uh, like a 20-hour fast in a four-hour eating window. Yeah, of one meal a one day. Or two, one meal a day or two meals a day. And um, when you look at science, what they'll tell you is these extreme forms of fasting actually is the quickest way to lose weight. <laughs> Right. So it makes sense. We, right. We find that um, alternate day fasting. So that's eating whatever you want one day and then eating less than 500 calories the next day. And mm -hmm. you just kind of repeat it back and forth, back and forth ends up actually um, winning out over any other form of fast. Really? Alternate day fasting. Interesting. Alternate day fasting. Right. And then they find that like the 5-2 and the 16-8 kind of similar. And I think maybe the 5-2 is a little bit better than the 16-8. Okay. Okay. However, the big problem with these fasts, like the OMAD, um, is we find that most people cannot continue that diet for a long time. Yeah, I can imagine. Right. right. And I can tell you um, specifically, like when you look at large studies across the board, that extreme form of fasting, like that 24 window or the alternate day fasting, uh, when you look at 90 days, only about 8% are continuing it. Mm. Yeah, because right. it's so unsustainable if you, a... <laughs> if you live with people or want like so any kind of life. <laughs> right, yeah. right, exactly. And like a year into it, even the 5-2 kind of fast, um, less than half of the people are continuing that. Okay. Even if it's not every other day. So 16-8 is kind of like the tortoise and the hare. It's the tortoise yes. that just yes. keeps going and maybe yes. wins the race at the end. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, like we talked about when you're training yourself, like we talked about that four hour fast first, and then you try to do, you know, four events to three eating events, you're not going to see a lot of weight loss in the beginning because fundamentally you didn't change how much you eat. Mm. Right. right. But people find that as you continue it for a year and then more years and more years, um, eventually the weight comes off and a lot of these uh, metabolic markers, so health markers really do improve. Okay. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that. Are there any more nuggets of wisdom that you want to give us before we end our talk today? Right. So um, I think we were talking about how, um, you know, final thoughts, like just like mental health and yes. I know some people have asked about that. Like if you yes. have no anxiety, 
Um, and I think that's kind of, oh, I, we're talking about the buckets, right? I forgot the last bucket. So the last bucket would be somebody who has something really big going on in their life. Oh, okay. So, right. So like you have a, a sick loved one that you have to care for. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. like your husband has to, um, you know, travel to a foreign country. Maybe they're deployed or they mm -hmm. took a new job. Like maybe you took a new job mm -hmm. um, and are transitioning. Um, or, or like you want to do something physical, like run a marathon. Um, you know, we talk about, is this the best time to start intermittent fasting? Uh, yes, no. because, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, um, you know, cause we find that food is a, a coping mechanism for a lot of us, you know, mm -hmm. actually for all of us, yeah. <laughs> it, it brings us so much joy. Right. Um, and to take away that resource when we're embarking something really big, um, or like if we're having a lot of trouble with our anxiety or with our depression, um, maybe we don't want to add that kind of to that schedule. We, you know, what, what we really want is to find uh, professional help during those times, right? Absolutely. I, I went through a terrible time last year. I lost my dad. And while that was happening, I didn't do IF. I wasn't even thinking about it. And, and you know, um, it, it would have been crazy for me to be like so strict to stick to it. You know, I did eventually get back to it, but it wasn't anything that was like important to me during that time. Right, yeah. right, right. And we talk about, you know, because we want IF to be a long-term solution, a permanent solution yes. for people. So there are going to be periods of our life, especially like you have a new baby, you're going to kind of not be able to do that. Or like mm -hmm. you have medical treatment, you're not going to be able to do that. But we want to be able to come back to it, even if it's six months to a year to even two years later um, to restart that process, right? Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I mean, currently I'm actually on antibiotics right now for something. And I, it's a very strong one that I have to take morning and night. So I'm actually not fasting right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't like it because I'm like, <laughs> I don't like eating late at night. It affects my dreams. Um, and I'm <laughs> yes. so used to not eating eating uh late that it's yeah so I can't wait to get off this thing so I can get back to it but it's good to know it's right. always there for us you know right right yes. and it's very effective and 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 like we said if we look at it long term in people who faith we practice it kind of on and off um long term um the health scores do improve because the weight does come up oh and I think that's the thing that I wanted to mention is uh in terms of health improvements we're not looking for a dramatic weight loss yes that's right 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 yeah. And so sometimes I have patients who come in um, and, you know, I'll, I'll just arbitrarily say they're 5'2 and they're 200 pounds and they're, you know, they want to lose um, a lot, a lot of weight. But, uh, you know, they lose 10 pounds, which is about 5% of their weight. And then all their labs are normal. I can stop all their medications, you know, sometimes. Right. Um, and, and I think we have to remember uh, and, and so what I also see is they're 200 pounds, they go to 190, and they just tip themselves over a little bit to get to 185, and then they don't have their period anymore. Oh, wow. Right, right. And so my patients will say, wait, this is not like the body shape that I want right now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I have to remind them, but this is your perfect weight. The labs are <laughs> because, good. Yes. Right. Because your body is great. You feel great. And when we push you um, beyond that, you don't feel great. Your body's telling you your hair is falling and you're not doing great. Yes. That's right. going to be so comforting for so many people, because I think a lot of it is, and I think I can say this safely, is vanity. You know, we want to look good. A lot of people yes. want to look you know, like the celebrities, they want to look skinny. Um, but that might not necessarily be a, their body type or right. B, because I know, I know people that, um, you know, someone in particular I'm thinking of that is not, has never been skinny per se. Right. And she's just finally accepted that, that that's not how she is. And, and that's okay. We're all different. And it's okay to embrace that and not right. strive for this thing at, at what cost, you know, so right. that's really comforting to hear. Right. And, and I think it just kind of goes back to, I think we know best when we feel good. Yeah. And the weight that we feel good at. Right. It's so funny because I went on this journey too, and it was all new to me. I wish I had you at the beginning of my journey. <laughs> that's why it's such a blessing that you're here helping people. Um, but I was alone. I had no clue what I was doing. And I got down really low, too low. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what? I'm not feeling good at this weight. It's too mm -hmm. low. So I started introducing healthy fast, uh, fats and varying my fast and trying to like gain a bit back. And I finally did. 
And so now I feel like I'm in a really good place with it. Mm -hmm. But it's so important. Again, another theme I'm getting here is intuition. And what is your body telling you? We have to listen to it. So yeah, if you're losing hair, if you're, if, you know, your body's like screaming out to you that it's not happy, then mm -hmm. we have to listen to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very empowering. Mm -hmm. Oh, one more. Sorry, uh, yeah, Jennifer. I love Some, it. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah. sometimes people are asking if they should be taking a multivitamin with ah, their fast. Okay. Yes. So the medical community as a whole generally does not recommend any kind of vitamin supplementation unless we know that you have a deficiency, which means... Oh. Right. So which means if I checked you for your iron and vitamin D and that was low, then I would say, oh, yes, please, you know, you should take, you know, X, Y, Z amount. I'll say a okay. specific milligram amount of how much you need. Um, so we know in the community that once you start consuming less than 800 calories a day on a regular basis, mm -hmm. we actually monitor these patients very religiously with lab work to make sure that they're not deficient. Okay. And they will get specific things, you know, particularly calcium and iron are really big ones. Yes. And vitamin B um, is a really big one as well. Okay. So should right. we all get mon should we all get our labs done and see what we're deficient in? Right. So um, you know, certainly everybody should go for the yearly checkup and yeah. get their regular bloods done. Um, but you know, I'm not an advocate of inflicting pain because I find labs painful. I don't like getting labs done myself. Yeah, same. Right. Right. So, um, and, you know, eating less than 800 calories uh, kind of consistently for a long time is not possible. That's just not physically yeah. possible. Those are special cases. So I would say by far, most of us are not in that category. Okay. That's interesting. Right. right. Um, I know just to bring in my own health here that I have suffered mm -hmm. from anemia in the past and mm -hmm. the doctor prescribed iron for me, like more mm -hmm. iron. So I have been mm -hmm. taking that and I took my labs again and it was back to normal. So then I went off the iron. Yes. Um, right. Is that, right. we don't keep you, we don't keep you on it. Right. Yeah. yeah because you don't, we're not fans of it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's really good to know because, so you don't recommend multivitamins basically yes. as a result. Yes. Oh, okay. Right. Unless I see something specific, you know, people are having really restrictive diets. Like I might check their blood or they're really consuming very little quantities of food. Um, then I might say, you know what, try to increase your calories, but, you know, maybe we'll do a supplement as well. Cause you know, your hair is, you're losing hair, et cetera, et cetera. So. Okay. So is it that it's just not effective at all neutral or is it detrimental? Would you say, um, you know, depending on the vitamins you get, a lot of times these things are not regulated at all. Mm -hmm. So the quantities in them are not what they always say are on the bottle, Okay. <laughs> which means it could be too little, which means you're just spending money. It's not doing anything. Mm -hmm. or it could be more than um, it's supposed to. Okay. Right. And then, I mean, yeah. I feel like I've been taking a high quality one for the past, well, for a very long time. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and some of them are excellent vitamins, but not yeah. across the board. And okay. so we don't say just across the board, just go buy anything. Oh, absolutely. Um, so it matters right. what you take for sure. Yes. If you do take yes. one. Okay. Yes. Good to know. Being very selective about what's in it. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, sometimes I see people say, oh, I want to take like a hail and hair and nail supplement, not mm. because the doctor recommended it, but because I just want to, which has large quantities of a certain vitamin. And then, you know, that's kind of something that you probably want to kind of have it checked just to make sure your levels are okay. Oh, okay. Uh, if you've been taking something for a long time too. So this is really good to know. Um, mm -hmm. One final question about this. I'm hearing so much about vitamin D. Do mm -hmm. you need vitamin D supplementation or how, is this something that I should, should be on my radar? So uh, it is recommended. Um, and typically for adults, if they go for their checkups, it's just included as part of your yearly physical. Oh, okay. Just, right. just get it checked, you mean? Yes. Okay. At, at least, you know, when I was training for kind of general medicine, we used to check it annually for all patients who came in. So for pediatrics, we don't check regularly for vitamin D unless there's something that's concerning. But for infants that are fully breastfed, we 100% supplement them with vitamin D until their first birthday. Oh, okay. That's so interesting. Right. So good to know. Oh, I feel like this was so valuable, this conversation. Um, oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. Yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to share with us? I mean, I, I just, you know, I think um, everybody knows uh, losing weight is not easy. Yeah, <laughs> right? I know, especially when we have these ingrained habits. Yes, it's it's the breaking of them and forming new ones. But I can personally attest that once you do that, it becomes easy. It just becomes your new normal. Yes, um, yes. And then it's preferable. Like for me, I love my early dinners. 
don't even want anything before bed because it's going to ruin my sleep and all of that. And so, mm -hmm. but that used to not be me, but it can become you basically. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And just the social aspects of eating, you know, we should never sacrifice our yes. uh, family because or relationships because we want to do a particular fast because right. all studies always say it's the social relationships that keep us happy and healthy long term. So yes, absolutely. I, and I, I'm the first one to break it if we go to dinner or if my daughter loves baking. So she'll often make these desserts and, you know, at night and I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> Right, right. You know, at least a bite. We got to take at least a bite, courtesy bite, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Patty, it is such a pleasure to have you on. I'm so grateful that you took your time to speak with us today. And thank you for coming. I hope that you will come back. Yes, anytime. Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Patty Tay. If you have any questions or comments, I would love to read them. Please leave them in the comment section down below. In the meantime, keep calm and remain classy, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.